The evidence supporting the two postulates of special relativity include the Michelson-Morley experiment and the spectrum of light from binary stars. Historically, it was thought that light, due to the rise in popularity of Maxwell's wave model of light, may require a medium to propagate in, just like other waves such as sound. Of course, we now know only mechanical waves require a medium to propagate in, and light being a non-mechanical wave does not have this requirement. In the 19th century, scientists proposed there must be a medium present throughout the universe allowing light to propagate through space. They called this medium the luminiferous ether. This model was created such that light's propagation is consistent with wave theory and explains why light can travel across long distances without the presence of any known substance in space. However, it is important to know that the ether model did not have any experimental evidence. It was purely theoretical. In the ether model, the ether is thought to be stationary and is thought to be the absolute frame of reference for all moving objects. That is, the relative velocity of all objects in the universe is measured and observed from the frame of reference of the ether. The movement of Earth through the ether creates what's known as the ether wind. The direction of the ether wind is always the opposite to the direction of Earth's velocity. So if Earth is moving towards the left, then the ether wind will be going towards the right. The direction of this ether wind is important to consider because the model proposes that light's velocity, like every other mechanical wave, is also affected by the direction of ether wind. If light propagates in the same direction as the ether wind, its velocity will increase. If light is traveling in the opposite direction as the ether wind, then its velocity will decrease. In the late 19th century, Mikkelsen and Morley conducted an experiment to measure the relative velocity of Earth through the ether. The experimental apparatus involved firing a beam of light at a half silvered mirror, which is a special type of mirror that can split the light ray into two perpendicular light rays as shown. These two perpendicular light rays then travel to two separate mirrors that are equal distance from the middle half silvered mirror. So when these light rays reach the mirror, they will be then reflected and then return to the half silvered mirror. When they meet in the middle, they will undergo interference. The experiment assumes that the velocity of the two perpendicular light rays will be different due to the effects of the ether wind on the light's velocity. The different effects of the ether wind on light's velocity will lead to a displacement between the two light rays when they converge again at the half silvered mirror, which results in a specific interference pattern that can be detected by a photo detector. Michael and Morley set up the experimental apparatus on top of a pool of mercury, which allowed them to test various angles between the light's propagation and the direction of the ether wind. Suppose that the ether wind at a particular instance in time is going towards the left. The light ray perpendicular to it will have a faster average speed and return to the half silvered mirror first. In contrast, the light ray that's traveling parallel to the ether wind will have a slower average speed and return to the half silver mirror after the first light ray that was perpendicular to the ether wind. If the two light rays are in phase, then the crest and the trough will undergo constructive interference and there will be no destructive interference occurring at all. So the amplitude of the two waves will simply amplify to give you a light wave with a high intensity. However, in the case of this experiment conducted by Mikkelsen and Morley, one of the light waves is slightly out of phase compared to the other due to the different velocity of the light caused by the ether wind. So when the light rays are now out of phase, they will undergo constructive interference as well as destructive interference, giving us a very specific interference pattern. The hypothesis made by Mikkelsen and Morley was that the interference pattern that they observed will change as the whole experimental apparatus was rotated on the pool of mercury. This is because Earth's velocity determines the direction of the ether wind, which in turn affects the velocity of the light rays, leading to a change in interference pattern with rotation. And this is because Earth's velocity will affect the direction of the perceived ether wind, 
The direction of the ether wind will then affect the velocity of the light rays depending on the angles. The differing velocities of the two perpendicular light rays in this experiment will result in an interference pattern. So if Mikkelsen and Morley rotated the apparatus, we can expect that the effect of the ether wind on the velocity of the two light rays will be changing, which results in a change in the interference pattern that was caused by the two light rays. An analogy that will help you understand the effect of the ether wind on the velocity of the two perpendicular light rays is imagining that there are two identically fit swimmers about to race. One swimmer is swimming across the river while the other is moving parallel to it. Each swimmer is to reach the flag equal distance from the starting point and back. As you can see, the swimmer's direction of travel is analogous to that of the light rays. So this is the light ray that's traveling perpendicularly to the ether wind, which is represented by the river flow. And this swimmer is the light ray number two, which is representing the light ray that was traveling parallel to the direction of the ether wind. The river flow in this analogy will have a different effect on the velocity of the swimmer depending on their direction of travel. The swimmer that's traveling perpendicular to the river flow direction will be affected less compared to the motion of the swimmer that's traveling parallel to the river flow. Before the experimental apparatus is rotated, the two perpendicular light rays would have already produced an interference pattern due to the different effects of the ether wind on the velocity of the light rays. When Mikkelsen and Morley rotated the experimental apparatus of Mercury, they hypothesized that the effect of the ether wind on the velocity of the light rays will start to change as well due to the changing angle between the velocity of light and the ether wind. So you will then expect the difference in the phases of the two light rays will change throughout the rotation of the experimental apparatus. And since the interference pattern depends on how much the two light rays are out of phase, as the experimental apparatus is rotated, the interference pattern that's caused by these two light rays will also start to change. To Mikkelsen and Mollitz's surprise, they observed that there were no changes in the interference pattern after the rotation of their apparatus on the mercury bed. They even repeated the experiment at different locations and time of the year, so that Earth's relative velocity will be different as it's orbiting the Sun. But there were still no changes in the interference pattern. Since no changes in the interference pattern was observed, the aim of the experiment, which was to measure the Earth's relative velocity could not be achieved. This was referred to as a null result of the experiment. The null result of Mikkelsen Morley's experiment meant that the ether model has serious flaws. Two possible conclusions could be drawn from this experiment. Either the experimental apparatus could not detect the ether wind, or the ether wind did exist but had no effect on light's velocity which was the assumption that Mikkelsen and Morley had for the experiment. Some scientists also proposed that perhaps the motion of Earth also dragged the ether with it, causing there to be no significant relative velocity between Earth and the ether, which meant that there was no ether wind, and therefore the velocity of the light rays wouldn't have been affected by the ether. Despite the Mikkelsen and Morley experiment being known as one of the most famous failed experiments in physics, it had numerous significant implications. It led more scientists to question the existence of the ether. So perhaps the ether does not actually exist. In addition, the Mikkelsen Morley experiment was one of the many early experiments that provided indirect evidence for special relativity, as the null results were consistent with the constancy of light speed, which is one of the postulates of special relativity. Since the second postulate of special relativity stems from the first postulate, that is, laws of physics apply the same way for all inertial frames of reference, it is thought that mikkelsen morley's experiment is an indirect evidence for both postulates of special relativity. The spectrum of light from binary star systems also provides evidence for the postulates of special relativity. A binary star system is one in which there are two stars rotating about their central mass in orbital motion. Scientists thought that light emitted from these stars will have varying velocities depending on the velocity of each star at the time of its emission. For example, 
Light emitted from a star that's approaching Earth will have a faster velocity, c plus v, where v is the velocity of the star at a given time, whereas light emitted from the star that is moving or receding away from Earth will have a slower velocity due to its orbital motion. This was known as the emission theory. The consequence of the emission theory meant that light emitted from the star that is approaching Earth due to its faster velocity will eventually catch up to the light that was emitted from the star that is moving away from Earth. So light emitted from this particular star that's moving away will travel towards Earth first, and sometime later, light emitted from the star that's approaching Earth, although it was emitted at a later time, due to its faster velocity, this particular light source will eventually catch up to the light source that was emitted earlier, but from the star that was receding away from Earth. Since light fundamentally determines our observation of these binary star systems, this phenomenon will result in a scrambled and out-of-sequence image. It will cause us to think that the orbital motion of the two stars is non-Keplerian. That is, they don't obey Kepler's laws of motion. Studies of binary star systems revealed no such cases where the binary stars do not follow Kepler's laws. All binary stars clearly were shown to obey Kepler's laws, and therefore, this provides evidence against the emission theory where light's velocity, dependent on the orbital velocity of the star from which they were emitted. Of course, this observation is consistent with special relativity, as the second postulate states that the speed of light is constant in a vacuum for all inertial frames of reference regardless of the velocity of the source, that is, binary stars themselves, or the observer, for example, a person on Earth. This concludes the video on evidence for the postulates of special relativity.